Yay, we're here. Hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, January 31st, 2014. That's it. We, we destroyed another January. Already. It. Already. It feels <laughs> just like it was December. So uh, this week, we've got a cool crew. We've got Dr. Brian Kobelin. Hi. David Dickinson, the hey, Gate guys. astronomer, which you will explain yes. shortly. Yes, I will. I have to get you to explain your, uh, your tagline every week. <laughs> it's getting hard to come up with new ones every week. Major Jason Major. Hey, Fraser. And um, Morgan Renberg, who has joined us three weeks consecutively now. Hey, Fraser. And Doctor, almost forgot this was happening, Nicole Gallucci. <laughs> Yay, galaxy mergers! <laughs> Yay, galaxy mergers! <laughs> You were doing, like, actual science. You were doing no, science, No, actually, though, I was right? doing uh, education, making educational stuff. You're doing an education. Doing an it education. It doesn't roll off the same way. It's not the same as doing a science. But this week, we've got lots of cool stories, so I will uh, sort of give you the gist. Uh, we're going to be talking about Hawking, saying there's no such thing as black holes. Discuss. Um, we're going to be talking about... Uh, which I think is going to be great. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, magnetic monopoles, uh, NASA's Day of Remembrance, the weather on brown dwarfs, planetary imaging on the cheap, Mars crossing comet, when to see Mercury, a river of hydrogen flowing into a galaxy, this cool image of uh, LRO, um, sorry, of Laddie, captured by LRO, which is amazing, um, and uh, the sun getting photobombed by the moon. And I think... <laughs> Before, crazy moon. <laughs> crazy moon. Before we do that, though, I think there's sort of like a big piece of news that some of us uh, talked about. I'm going to see if I can make this happen. All right. And I, and I know that I'm going to get a takedown request as soon as I do this. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, go for it. If you guys Rebel. have any, any guess what I'm about to do. Okay, here we go. Are those the exact same seashores that Carl was standing on? Yes. I don't know. The, orig the, the one with the... Yes. Who, yeah, I think so. Was... Yeah. Who was old? Who's old enough to have watched the original when it ran in the seventies? I have it on 80, DVD. Eighties, nineteen eighty, nineteen eighty. What? What should we do? Should we like do like some kind of live hangout while we watch it with the with the oh god with the, no. with the fans? <laughs> you don't need my snark. It'll, it'll really? my, my oh, snark you think it's too much snark? It. You don't think that you could like hold yourself from snarking too much, Nicole? I snark at everything. Right. But that's Even fun. things I love. That this is cool. how I show my love. <laughs> oh, come on. That's not really the Andromeda Galaxy. I don't know. Like, what will we do? What will we snark? I, 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 just, I just hope they put it up online afterwards for us folks who don't have cable. <laughs> yeah. They won't. Ooh. I think I, should, I might I'm, be getting you know, it. It's going to be on the regular Fox, so... I'm yeah, getting a little yeah. antenna digital tuner, partly so I can yeah. snark at the Hulu, Olympic opening Hulu. ceremony, but also... Hulu may run it. Hulu may Hulu run it. Hulu will run it. Yeah. yeah. I'll just have to watch it the day after. Ooh, so ooh. just to uh, remind can, can everyone... Can it be seen in Europe? Wait, question already from Hugo Burnham. Can, do you think it will, it will air in Europe, if ever? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, well, I don't know. How often do you get The Simpsons? You know, it's the same same people. Yes. Okay. Um, family Guy. Uh, right. So just one last reminder, <clears throat> which is that if you want to interact with us, you may. Uh, one place to do it is on the Q and A app, which is uh, available. Should be you should be able to just click it while you're watching this video, and then you'll see the place where you can can talk to us, ask your questions. Apparently, the frame rate is very slow. I don't know. The internet bad. I apologize for the internet. Less um, takedown. Potential? Yeah, yeah. It came through so bad. Yeah, it came through so badly that we get... Just go watch it. You Do a search for Cosmos trailer, and you should see it. In fact, you'll see an article from Casey Dreyer who who wrote about it so and already critiqued it. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think? How do you feel about Cosmos, the new version of Cosmos, hosted by our good friend Neil deGrasse Tyson? I think it seems really awesome, the idea of it. I'm just... Like a lot of people, I'm worried that it's going to be a little too, uh, a little too visually illustrative. I, I guess I'm using a nice word for it. The bad word is be is be chock full of CGI crap. So <laughs> I don't know. You know, I I I love the idea of it and and everything around it. I just hope that in the end, it's not just too much yeah. eye candy and not enough 
actual science, I guess. No, I, I remember Carl getting a lot of flack for the original, too, from the science yep. community, actually, that for, for stepping out what they thought into being a celebrity scientist. He got a lot of flack for that, too, so... We'll see. So maybe this is just following suit, and you can't really blame them for it because they're just doing a modern interpretation of what Carl did back in the 70s. So you go, yeah. hey, Cosmos was Cosmos. Just because we have better CGI now doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. I think, I think no matter what we love or don't love about it, the fact that there will be science on primetime network television... On Fox, yeah. no amazing. less. It's just amazing. Because there's been a lot of recent, I guess... Documentaries that I've have been very happy with stuff that's been on the National National Geographic things like that like there's one that came out was like what would happen if a blob of dark matter passed through the solar system like and and the, and they got these movie. poor scientists to like predict what would happen if this happened right I mean hasn't happened. Can't happen, won't happen. It's not a problem, right? And so, but they, but they, for some reason they need to turn everything into something catastrophic. Now I love the end of the universe. Don't do that to the scientists. Think of yeah, the think of the scientists. You know, like I love the end of the world as much as anybody, more than anybody. I am the worst. But even I cringed at at that kind of stuff. So I'm just hoping that that maybe there will be less some... apocalypse, more inspiration. Mm -hmm. I just think it's. I think it's going to be something we can get behind the science community to say, "Yay, there's space out there." That's cool. <laughs> well, did you watch? Did anyone watch through the wormhole? I watched it. No, I did you that. watch it? Yeah. It started out trying to, you know, like be fairly mainstream science, and then it really just went through the wormhole. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And by the end, ones there's like, you know, are there ghosts and is God real and there's all kinds of. <laughs> Topics that yeah, you know, what what do aliens eat for lunch? I mean, it's just they, they went they went way too far into the speculative, and yeah. you know I, I don't know what that says. I don't know what that's that's a worse statement about. I don't know if that's a worse statement about you know where the where the networks are going, um, or if it's just what if it's a worse statement about all people can can comprehend and want to wrap their brains around. Um, I mean, there was a great series on that I really liked. It was how the universe worked. Um, and that never that. went into the, the it never went into kooky town. Had awesome visuals. Uh, uh, micro narrated. Um, you know, he's not a scientist, but he likes science. Um, and and I just really really enjoyed it. And and it was almost to the point where I'd seen so many of them that I'm just like calling out, that's you know, that's a this, that's a type one A supernova. And uh, nobody wanted to watch it with me because you know I was that guy. But still, it's it was interesting, and it yeah. never got weird. It never it never went down to the lowest common denominator. So I wonder how much control Neil deGrasse Tyson's had. Will, will he will he be able? Did he have script approval? Was he able to to you know because he knows his stuff obviously. Well, less and he, script and more editing. I think. Yeah, and to be yeah. able to say no, we're not going to talk about this. No, we're not going to include that in the in the show. That's you know that's I think that's the question. So if he was able to you know, enforce his opinions, then I think it'll be great. And if he was sort of rolled over, then, you know, could get a little sensational. I, I think as much as we complain about it or, or tend to complain about it, the bar is set so low that, oh. that anything oh, science... Wow. No, oh. no I, I, mean, I mean, when you think of science television, so much of it is crap. hype and sensationalism. Yeah, so much of it is crap. And, and so to have anything that is accurate and clear, even if it is hyper CGI and over sensationalized in some degree, it's better than what's been there. Yeah, yeah I think there's... we could all be improved with a booming soundtrack. I think that'd be great to have yeah. an orchestra playing every moment. Put the bass up and moment. I'll believe anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, in fact, I think we should do that. We should have an orchestra playing in the weekly space <laughs> from here on out. Um, okay, well, let's get on with the big, the big story. And this, uh, well, this was something. So, so Stephen Hawking said uh, there's no such thing as black holes. Brian, that Stephen Did Hawking I actually roll hard enough. Yeah, I can hear it. I can hear that. The, your eye roll just <laughs> grinding through the uh, through the video. It it depends on what you mean by black hole, and that's the thing. I mean, so what did Stephen Hawking say? Stephen Hawking was presented, it's a three-page paper, it's actually just a transcript of a talk. So it, it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail. 
Um, but it basically prevent, provides an overview of an idea to try to solve what's known as sometimes the information paradox or the firewall paradox. So basically what this is, you have a black hole, and in simple terms, a black hole has an event horizon, and the event horizon is a point of no return. It's a cosmic rich motel. So anything that goes into an event horizon, when you cross the event horizon, you're never coming out. So that has certain problems for quantum mechanics, because, or thermodynamics, actually. Um, one of the things in thermodynamics is that information should be conserved. We, we normally talk about it in terms of entropy, but, but this is an idea of how much information does it take to describe a system. The problem with a black hole is that based on thermodynamics, the entropy can never decrease. That's normally how we say it. But it means that information can't be destroyed. You, you can't just make things disappear. And the problem with a black hole is that if you throw information into a black hole and it never comes out, it's gone. So, so you've, you've destroyed information. Now, there is a way through Hawking radiation to get the information back. And what happens is when Hawking originally proposed this idea of Hawking radiation, it was completely random. Basically, you get these quantum fluctuations on the surface of the black hole, and they cause the radiation to come off slowly. It radiates away the black hole. When Hawking first proposed it, it was random, but other people have looked at it and said, no, actually, the information could be radiating off of the black hole. So if you throw a book into the black hole, the information of that book radiates off so that technically you never, you never lose it. The problem with that is that in order to get the information out, quantum mechanics steps in and basically the system... There's, uh, how do I... <laughs> this is hard to describe. <laughs> um, oh, this there's is, a thing called entanglement. That basically, in order to get the information out, you, you have to snap off the information from inside the black hole. You get this you get this massive firewall, basically, around the black hole. And and this has been a discussion. You know, if a if you dropped an astronaut into a black hole, would he go in and never come out, or would he get vaporized by this firewall due to the quantum fluctuations? We don't know the solution to that. And so Hawking in this paper proposed an idea that perhaps there isn't a hard and fast event horizon. Perhaps what there is is this very turbulent layer that because of all the quantum fluctuations near the event horizon, you don't get a, a rigid event horizon. You get this really turbulent layer so that information can come out. You don't have a firewall. So things can go into the black hole. The information can come out. The paradox is resolved. However, that's done at the cost of meaning that you don't have an event horizon. That's problematic in general relativity. So, so it's an interesting idea. It doesn't go into any details. But if Hawking is right, and you define a black hole as having an event horizon, then he is saying, in fact, that there are no black holes. Um, but on, a, on an astrophysical sense, we're not saying that black holes go away. What we would call a black hole at the center of the universe, we would still call it a black hole. It just would be a black hole without an event horizon. So he's arguing so, semantics more than anything else, kind well, of. Well, yeah. he's, he's not arguing semantics. The, the semantics is about how do you define a black hole. He is arguing that we can resolve this very complex paradox in quantum physics by describing black holes as things without event horizons. In other words, instead of event horizon, you get this turbulent state. Now, yeah, some people would say, look, no event horizon, no black hole. Hawking is saying there are no black holes. Other people, and I'm part of that, I'm, I'm in an astrophysics black hole, so if I see this huge, dense mass, it's a black hole, um, would say, those are still there, they just don't have event horizons. And yeah, have, you know, just to keep have, in mind, this is very hypothetical, and it's, he has no detail, and it's a three-page long summary of, here's an idea, this is a thing that we should look at. Not everyone's convinced, and the details still have to be gone through. Yeah, the, the gravitational effects that they're going to exhibit in our universe aren't going away. <laughs> right. No, so those, those there. are still going to be there. We would still consider yeah. them black holes on an astronomical sense. Uh, we have a question from Mark Gillick. Why is information destroyed and not just stuck in the black hole? Uh, the whole idea of thermodynamics is that the information of a system, you can always in principle recover it. 
it's it's kind of a cause and effect thing that you know if you have a book full of information and you rip it up and and scatter the pieces to the wind in principle you could gather those pieces up put them back together and glue it back together in a book you just got the information even if you burned it all the little ash and smoke you could technically go back and figure out where it all came from and have the book back but if you throw something into a black hole you can't reverse that the the problem is that the black hole event horizon is a one way trip and everything in physics is reversible and thermodynamics things are reversible but that information could be recovered in principle i mean in practical in practice you're never going to get that but in principle right. you could always get the information back with a black hole not even in principle can you Right, but it's this idea that you could run time backwards, right? That that time doesn't have to go forward or backward. All of the calculations, if you just reverse time and reverse things, things still work. But yes. in the case of a black hole, you can't run time backwards. Right, yeah. right. And that's the idea. But and I it's thought, weird. I thought entropy meant you can't run time backwards anyway. Well, ent entropy means that... that it, it, Entropy doesn't make the laws of physics time irreversible. Mm -hmm. What what it means is that there's there's a directionality to the way things happen. So the thermodynamics, hot things go from hot to cold. You can make something go from cold to hot. You can make something colder, but you do that at the cost of creating more entropy, more heat elsewhere. Your refrigerator makes more heat than it does cold. So so you can do the same thing in thermodynamics. In principle, you can reverse things, but you do it at the cost of losing energy everywhere else. So, so, it's, it's... so to summarize, he's got a different way of looking at a black hole that doesn't require an event horizon and so preserves the information and it's interesting and people will need to crunch that into their existing models and see what that does. Right. Okay. Right. Got it. So here's a guy that's been thinking about black holes for 50 years, so I guess when, obviously, when Stephen Hawking has an idea about it, people tend to listen, when, uh, listen up. When, when a black hole comes careening into our solar system, we can say, you might not exist. Yeah, I just believe event you. Horizon. Yeah, I just believe you. <laughs> um, uh, okay, well, let's move on. Uh, we look forward to future updates, Brian. I suspect you will be working on this for months. Just update after update. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. It'll, it'll yeah. come back later and later. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dave Dickinson, I want to talk to you about yes. the uh, brown dwarf weather patterns. Yeah. I'm going to try and dig up the video for that one. It's super cool. Yeah, this was an interesting study came out of the Max Planck Institute over in Germany where they actually managed to catch some detail on the, I wouldn't say surface, more like kind of the cloud tops of a brown dwarf pair. Now, this is a pair that was actually in the news last year was uh, it's called Lumen 16A and B and also has a, a NeoWise phone number attached to it too from the WISE survey, but I won't even try to dig that up and repeat it. It's easier to say Lumen 16A and B. 6.5 6 light years distant was just discovered last year and it is the closest discovered object since they found Bernard Star in the early 20th century. They're not quite stellar objects. It's, it's more proper to call brown dwarfs as substellar objects. They kind of bridge that mass gap between extrasolar planets and low mass red dwarfs. Usually that's pegged at around 12 to 80 Jupiter masses or so. These two objects are right around the 40 to 50 Jupiter mass range and they're 6.5 light years away in the constellation Vela, I believe, in the southern hemisphere. I remember right from writing it yesterday. And it's interesting, they actually did an animation map. Now what they used was a technique called indirect Doppler imaging that they, managed, they used uh, from the Keck telescope down in the ESO observatory down in Chile. And they actually managed to, I, I caught up with some of the researchers and I was curious, one thing I didn't see in looking through the papers or looking through the press release is the actual inclination and the rotational speeds on these objects. And I was surprised to find they're pretty fast rotators. They, they think from what they were seeing from this indirect technique is that uh, a, the A component was rotating about three, once every three hours, and the B component, I believe, they said was rotating once every eight hours. Now, that's faster than Jupiter, which rotates the fastest rotating planet in our solar system, which rotates at 9.9 .9 hours. So these things are really, they're spinning pretty good. That's tentative, by the way. They said that, that three-hour measurement, but they, they think that's pretty close to what they 
what they measured. And when they were mapping these objects out, it's interesting where you can actually see dark areas and light areas. And we're actually seeing, I just think it's amazing, we're seeing detail on extrasolar objects. And I know they've actually managed to do some indirect measurements of star spots before. Uh, I've wrote about that before. But to actually, within a decade or so, we may actually be able to get this technique down with these larger observatories that are going online. We may actually be able to get this technique down to get detail on extrasolar planets. Now, that would be cool. And something like a decade or two ago, I mean, we hadn't even discovered or, or imaged any exoplanets like over a decade. The first exoplanet discovery was back in 94, and it's only been within the last decade they've actually had any, uh, some of the first like Formal B where they've actually managed to get some images of exoplanets. So this is kind of cool. A lot of brown dwarf news this year already. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the amazing things is that when you think of a brown dwarf and all the artist illustrations, they show a star, right? That it's like a, yeah. it, it's like a reddish or a brownish colored or a purplish colored version of a star, but it's still got sunspots and and it, it, like it seems like it's like the artist there, illustration is always very star-like, and and yet you know it's very much like a big Jupiter, like a big. They're they're kind of coming into their own star. thing. They're they're not quite stars yeah. and they're not. White exoplanets. They they do a low grade type of fusion known as deuterium burning. So they're not doing the full proton proton chain like red dwarf stars. They're they're not actually burning. I asked a scientist what color it. is a brown dwarf, and I think the answer was purple. <laughs> Purplish. Yeah, I, I believe their categories, their stellar Infrared? classification are, are yeah. T yellow or T Y and and L. Are, are the yeah. stellar classifications for them? But yeah, they usually I've seen them depicted as deep purple, or yeah, they're they're interesting objects. I mean, if you were in the solar system with a brown dwarf, you would see it, right? Oh, definitely, because oh, yeah. I said even the lower mass ones are thirteen times the mass of Jupiter at the lower end, so they. Would but would it be giving be, off light? Mostly in infrared. It, it wouldn't be shining. It, it it would be mostly in infrared and then reflected light. Would a brown dwarf cast a shadow, I guess is the question I'm asking. In infrared. In infrared. infrared. I'm not in infrared. <laughs> I, I would say the lower mass ones, probably not. Maybe yeah. when you get toward the, that's just, just me talking as, as a non-astrophysicist, but I'd say maybe when you get up toward that blurry line toward brown dwarf and red dwarf, you might get some visible light. But. I am completely if, incapable of doing screenshots today for some reason. That Cosmos trailer was as much screenshotery as I'm allowed. <laughs> this entire is the screen year. share broken uh, for you? Yeah, it's totally broken. It broke so, for me on Wednesday. Yeah, so if anyone, for example, named Jason Major wanted to put a screenshot up at some point, that would be awesome. Um, I, I've, I haven't been able to get screenshots to work for, for months for some reason. So mm. either, I'm, either I'm just doing it wrong or uh, you're doing yeah, it wrong. Do it right. Completely busted for Georgia and I on Wednesday. Yeah, I can try, but I don't think it will work. I have another way I can do this. I have the yeah, I have my alternative way. I actually picked up my webcam and turned it around and pointed it at my monitor. Oh, good one. <laughs> so <laughs> All right. there's always that. Um, yeah, I have another way I can do this. Let me try yeah, this. Mine's not happening. Is that it? But they're cool. In the interim, I'd like to let you guys know to use the Q&A app to ask us any questions or comments. Or the, oh, I see it. Hugo just posted it on the uh, event page. Uh, he just posted the little spinny map of the Brown Dwarf. So you guys can comment there as well. You know, usually whenever I'm talking to researchers about Brown Dwarfs, too, something that always interests me is, you know, it's not out of the question that a Brown Dwarf could be undiscovered closer than Alpha Centauri. Now, this is... it's. Right. This is entirely outside the discussion of Nibiru and, and that kind of, like, nonsense. But it's uh, it's not out of the question. It, it kind of raises the question when they discovered this one at only 6.5 light years this pair last year, you know, that there, there could be some in, in the WISE survey that are still lurking out there that are waiting to be found. Now, that, that would be kind of a cool discovery if they found a, uh, a brown dwarf closer than Alpha Centauri. Oh, Nicole's got it. Thank you, Hugo. <laughs> Who there? Hold on. Go. Go, Nicole. Hey, thank, thanks to Hugo for posting it. I just cut Looks, my it, it, it. It reminds me of the Hubble images of Pluto they did a few years ago. <laughs> kind of yeah. it. But it's uh, just, just the fact we're getting any kind of blurry detail yeah. and we can actually pin down rotation speed. And once we can start getting spectra 
off exoplanets, then it's going to be really interesting because then we can start seeing uh, kind of what they're made of and those, those we've interesting... We've already been able to get some spectra off of exoplanets. That's amazing. That um, is very so, cool. All right. We've been able to get some um, atmospheric data and stuff. Exometeorology. Yes. All right. Yeah. Speaking of Nicole Gallucci, uh, yeah. let's talk about this river of hydrogen that's flowing into a galaxy. River of hydrogen. Yeah. Um, so this story comes out of my favorite, one of my favorite places in the world, Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia, uh, and a scientist by the name of DJ Pisano. Oh, sorry, DJ, if I pronounced your last name wrong. Um, did a study looking for uh, cold rivers of hydrogen gas. And by cold, I mean stuff that's not really turbulent. Uh, it's thought that these cold rivers of hydrogen are what f uh, feed star formation in galaxies like the Milky Way, these spiral galaxies, or like the one he found this around, which is NGC 6946. Um, but in the past, we've only been able to discover about 10%. We've only seen 10% of the hydrogen uh, or the hydrogen gas needed to form stars. So our galaxy forms, on average, one solar mass of stellar material a year. So imagine one sun being born every year. That's the star formation rate of our galaxy. But they've only seen about a tenth of that mass flowing into galaxies before when searching with interferometers. Now, interferometer, radio interferometers are lovely and amazing and wonderful, but they do have a couple of um, shortcomings. One is that you don't see the diffuse, fluffy... Uh, gas so much, um, you need a single dish radio telescope to do that. And so using the Green Bank Telescope, uh, it's incredible sensitivity. It's the biggest fully steerable radio telescope on the planet. Uh, DJ was able to uh, see and map out this, uh, this hydrogen gas and specifically the colder streams that are falling into this galaxy to create star formation. So all the stuff for star formation that we need turns out to be right there in front of us. It was just really difficult to see without the Green Bank Telescope. Now GBT is sitting right in the middle of a radio quiet zone, so you know it gets it gets super super high definition listening capabilities or watching ah! capabilities. I'm sorry, yeah, that's <laughs> watching capabilities out into deep space like that. Because right. uh, I guess I guess that just means there's there's no communication that's that's allowed in and out of that zone. I don't know how they stop. So they have um, different radii around the observatory over which they have different levels of control. Right at the observatory itself, there's no Wi-Fi. Well, no, there's no Wi-Fi. Uh, there, no, there are no cell phone towers. Uh, you, uh, visitors are expected to turn to not use digital cameras on site. Uh, there uh, are no. Uh, you have to have diesel-only cars near the telescope because spark wow. plugs oh, in most cars. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they have a fleet of diesel cars, some of them dating back to the 60s that they still keep running, which are fantastic. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, all of these things create radio frequency interference. And then uh, in a larger radius, the people who live right near the observatory are also restricted in what they can use. Um, and then around this large rectangular region that expands all the way into central Virginia, uh, they do have some say in uh, how strong a transmitter can be built and uh, in what direction it can be pointed. And so anything in that zone... Uh, they have a say in what happens. So once you get closer and closer to Green Bank, your cell phone's not going to work. Hmm. Um, no. <laughs> and we, we've great oh microwaves now. A lot of microwaves on site unless they're in a big Faraday cage, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, except when I'm hungry. Um, so I of course love this place and love this telescope because I spent so much time working there, and it is really unique in being able to pick up these real this really sensitive be very sensitive to pick up this diffuse emission. Uh, and of course, uh, the National Science Foundation has recommended it for divestment, meaning that they will not be able to. They, they don't think they'll be able to fully fund the telescope and the facility into the future. And so uh, the NRAO is looking for partners uh, to to uh, team up with to help keep the telescope running. So amazing science coming out of this telescope at the time when the NSF's recommended divestment. Kind of a, an odd combination. That seems to be the thing that happens. Yeah. Um, I choose Morgan to talk about the NASA's Day of Remembrance. Yes, that is today. Uh, and is once a today? year, it is today, 31st of yeah. January every year, yeah. NASA takes a day to remember uh, fallen astronauts. Uh, and whenever I'm talking about you know, things in space that are dangerous, I like to say that no one's ever died in space because I think that's a pretty remarkable achievement considering we've been exploring for you know 50 or 60 years now. But people have died in pretty much every other phase. They've died preparing to go to space, they've died on their way, and they've died coming back. And it's important to stop and re remember uh, the sacrifices that they make 
And NASA does that once a year. There will be ceremonies at the various space flight centers today at Kennedy. Um, and, you know, I think it's good for people to, to take a moment and think about uh, how dangerous it is to be an astronaut, uh, or really a lot of the people who work in and around the space program. You know, we often sit here and report on things like, uh, you know, a spacewalk happened and an astronaut's helmet was filling up with water, and, you know, as if that was a bad day at work. And, you know, for him it is, but it's a dangerous situation. And, and then we say, you know, well, we sent them back out, but this time they had a snorkel. Uh, you know, as if that's, you know, a sane solution to the problem. Uh, now, these are brave people uh, who do brave things every day so that we can do amazing science on the International Space Station uh, and so that we can sort of have the opportunity to wonder at the things that, uh, that we're learning about the universe. Uh, and they deserve to be remembered. Now, the, the specific dates, the specific events that they're looking to to commemorate, um, sort of which are, what are the, I mean, it's three main events, right? Right. So the first time that we lost people was during Apollo 1. And this was actually about a month before launch. They were preparing the spacecraft. It was uh, the first uh, test, basically, of internal power. So they disconnected all the batteries and things that they use uh, to test it, and they were running it just off the batteries in the spacecraft. Uh, and a spark happened. Uh, and we never really found out where the spark came from. There's some different uh, ideas, but a spark happened. It caught something in the cockpit on fire, and that ignited the pure oxygen environment, um, and it killed three uh, astronauts who were preparing to be the first Apollo crew. Uh, and that was a real wake-up call for NASA and for you know America as a whole, because in the three or four previous years to that, it seemed like we could do nothing wrong in space. You know, once we'd gotten uh, the Mercury astronauts into space, we were progressing almost on a weekly basis. You know, we'd have one person in there, then two people, then we were docking spacecraft, we had spacewalks, we, we were doing everything. And, you know, we were well on our way to getting to the moon ahead of schedule. Uh, but accidents happened, and we had to stop and think, you know, how can we make the space program safe enough to justify the lives of the people who we're asking to, to go out there for us? And NASA really stepped up at that time and said, we want to take this investigation, we want to go forward, we want to improve ourselves. And, and they did. They stopped for more than a year and redesigned everything about the space program. And as we now know, all the all the Apollo missions, all the Skylab missions, everything up through the space shuttle, never again was there a, a life lost. And even in the event of serious accidents like Apollo 13, uh, we were able to, to deal with that. Um, and the same thing sort of happened uh, with Challenger, which was the next uh, big uh, accident in, in NASA's history. And, you know, this was, I have here, STS-51. So that means we'd already launched the space shuttle 50 times successfully. The space shuttle was launching, you know, once a month almost, uh, leading up to Challenger. And look at the things we were doing in space. We were, we were preparing, at this time, the Hubble Space Telescope, which turns out wouldn't launch for a long time afterwards. Uh, but we were going to the frontiers once again. And, and once again, we were reminded you know, how dangerous space can be. Uh, and once again, it turned out that this was something that was preventable and that with, you know, better oversight and more care taken, we would have been able to save the lives of these astronauts. And NASA took that to heart and, again, redesigned uh, the space program, and, and off we went again. And that continued, again, for another 50 missions. Uh, space Shuttle launched uh, 56 times between that and Columbia, which happened... Uh, in 2003, that was STS-107. So here we'd launched Hubble, we'd fixed Hubble, uh, we'd launched a whole fleet of other spacecraft and satellites and things. We were building the ISS. Uh, once again, it seemed like everything was going right in space. And and then Columbia happened, and, and we had to once again reevaluate, you know, is the space shuttle safe? How can we make it safer? How do we protect the lives of people who who are up there, because it's a dangerous job, but that's no excuse for not giving them the best protection that we can. And we sat down one, 
once again came up with new procedures and and here we are again in the midst of uh, a golden era in sort of human spaceflight. Uh, the ISS is operating uh, well. It's we, We're repairing it in space. Here we are living in space once again. And that's really because of uh, the lessons that we've learned from these past missions. And I think if there's just one thing to kind of take away, it's that the pressures of space flight are so great that even the smallest problem can be almost immediately magnified into a, a catastrophic event. We're talking about a frozen O-ring, a, a tiny chink out of a uh, heat shield, a spark in the cockpit. Now, these were things that anywhere else in the world would be, you know, put on a list of things to fix. But in the space program, they were immediately catastrophic. And, you know, that's why sometimes we feel like, you know, the NASA bureaucracy go so slowly and that there's all these hoops to jump for and you know why do things cost so much money uh, and it's because you know when people's lives are on the line we have to get things right the first time and you know unfortunately we can't always we have a question from Alexander Howlett asking uh, do Roscosmos or, or any of the other space agencies around the world have similar remembrance days you know, I don't remember. I don't know if they have similar remembrance days, but they have. Russia, in particular, has lost other astronauts, uh, and in a particularly sort of tragic sense, uh, Russia lost their first astronaut just months before uh, the United States lost their first one, and it happened in the same way. It was a cockpit fire in an all all oxygen environment. Uh, and in the same way, it asphyxiated uh, the cosmonaut. And, you know, Russia didn't admit this until 1986. And, you know, had they, you know, been up front and said, you know, we lost somebody and because of, you know, sparks in an oxygen environment, you know, maybe NASA would have had the chance to reevaluate uh, the Apollo program and make the changes that they ended up making prior to uh, Apollo 1 instead of after. Yeah, that's... It's, it's tough that they didn't have that information going back and forth. And hopefully now everything is a lot more out in public and transparent and people can share this information. Absolutely. Um, well, you know, we could do a whole show on this, so, uh, but, but it's, it's great to remember it each, each year. And I mean, I, I definitely <laughs> lived through both the Challenger and the Columbia, and I reported on the Columbia one. That was, my, that was sort of my job back then, and it was quite awful to go through. Right. I, I remember seeing Columbia about a week prior on a, during a star party. We saw it pass overhead, and you know we they're so common to see ISS and Columbia in, in space shuttle passes. You don't think anything of it, but that was only less than a week before the disaster happened. So yeah, the issue had already happened, and they just didn't know yet. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's move on um, to Jason Major's story about the sun getting photobombed by the moon, and I don't know whether I can. Uh, have you got a picture, well, Jason? I do. I can try to. Um, All right. I can try to screen share here. Let's see. I'll pull this up. This was actually uh, this was something pretty cool from yesterday. Um, All right. Screen share this. I hit start. There we go. Can you see the video? Mm, now we can. Now we can. Yeah. Okay. Now what's happening here is obviously the uh, uh, NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory keeps a pretty steady stare at the sun uh, in several different wavelengths of light. Here's another one from its atmospheric imaging assembly. Uh, this is 304, I believe. And the moon uh, decided they wanted to get in on the show, too, or at least see what the heck uh, STO was staring at. So it kind of, you know, stood up in the front row there and over the course of two and a half hours drifted in front of the sun. Um, now its silhouette is nice and sharp because the moon has no atmosphere, so it you know look basically looks like a a, a nice clear sphere there. Um, I'll play it again because it's because then I'll come up to the next point here. Um, so as it did that, it was uh, I think it first showed up in front of the sun at 8:30 in the morning Eastern time yesterday, and just as it drifts off to the right there, you can see an M-class flare erupt from active region 1967. Now that's a sunspot region that is uh, rotating right now to face Earth. So this was um, this was a, a little private eclipse that SDO had yesterday, uh, and this happens every you know this happens about 
I want to say two or three times a year um, as as the spacecraft enters these various nodes in its orbit. Uh, I'm going to shut the screen share down now. How do I do that? Just come back over here and click no. How do I unscreen share? You did it. You did oh, it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You unscreen so, share. So this happens a couple times a year. It's not a surprise to the mission scientists. Um, they know that this is. They know that this is. These events are coming up, and it, and it gives them a chance to uh, kind of take a peek at at the at the moon. Um, it also lets them recalibrate the uh, recalibrate SDOs uh, aim towards the sun a little bit. Um, and every now and then, it, it, the Earth actually does the same thing. But when the Earth moves in front of the sun, the silhouette's a lot less clear because obviously we have an atmosphere, um, we're bigger, we're closer, and so the uh, the edge isn't that nice, that nice sharp mountainous line like the moon has. Um, but you know, these are these are interesting events just because you know, you're staring at the sun all this time, you get a little action every every uh, you know every few months or so. So uh, that that happened yesterday with the with SDO having its its uh, little private eclipse moon dance. Most cool. of the, most of the motion you're seeing there is actually SDO's motion. A little bit of it's the moon, but it's that's why it's got that weird curve to it. It's actually the curve of SDO's orbit. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the moon isn't isn't really meandering around the uh, the solar system like that. So yeah. that's that's most of the spacecraft. And there's even a little bit of a shake there because as as oh, the moon blocks the light, it kind of messes up. SDO's tracking abilities a little bit, so it's not it's not able to like immediately zero in on the sun. So it kind of gets blocked a little bit and it, it wobbles, in it, but it's able to you know come back into come back into play. Now, what's interesting here is what's going to happen as that new sunspot region starts to face Earth. I mean, are we going to be looking at more flares, more uh, solar activity? Uh, you know, so watching that is kind of a kind of big deal too. So just just so happens the moon got in the way. It's eclipse season. It's eclipse season. It's eclipse season for SDO. Like I said, this happens a couple of times a year just because of just because of uh, uh, the spacecraft's inclination. Uh, so you know, every now and then, everything lines up in just such a way so that it gets in the way of the. Uh, Can they the do the any science with it? I believe most of the science that's done is um, is alignment, really. I mean, just kind of using that to figure out where exactly, uh, you know, to the. Zero 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 point. Uh, you know, SDO is on track, so they can kind of like you know focus that in and make sure. And they, I think they do some focusing, but I, I, I'm I don't believe they're actually pulling you know research data about the moon you know uh, per se. Uh, now it might be interesting because I, I don't know if it's something where they could get some details about the moon's exosphere. Yeah, uh, so you know, the very very it's, thin it's atmosphere. atmosphere yeah. That, yeah, so I don't know. Nicole's but, just yeah, saying no. Leave that to <laughs> leave that to Laddie and and all the other missions there, that are actually uh, devoted. There, there is some discussion about exosphere studies. I've seen a recent paper that I'm mulling about writing about uh, during lunar eclipses from Earth, which is kind of interesting. But. So speaking of Laddie, uh, we got a new photograph of Laddie. Did you like that segue? Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, right was cool. Cool. Jump After all you. over that one. Segue for the win. So uh, we have, over the last few years, we have an increasing number of spacecraft photographing other spacecraft as they are uh, doing their job around other uh, objects in the solar system. And so the most recent one is this photograph of Laddie, the lunar atmosphere dust... Explorer. Environment, Explorer. Explorer. Environment Explorer. I keep saying exosphere. It's Environment Explorer. Uh, taken with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, and those of you, this is why I tweeted yesterday that I cannot spell reconnaissance to save my life. And my screen share is broken. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, yours too. Okay. My Let me screen share just that. broke. Yeah, so there's this lovely picture um, of the moon's surface, this high-resolution picture of the moon's surface, like we are used to seeing for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter with a little smudge. Uh, a little smudge, and you zoom in on the little smudge, and it, it looks kind of like a, a flying saucer or UFO. I mean, it is literally a smudge nope. in the image. I can't show a GIF. Oh, for mm. crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> <Here> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> See that little there circle? And then it looks like this little, like, smudge imaging. 
there. No tech screen share. This is great. Shush. Cool. And then when they actually de-smear the smudge, you see an actual shape and object, and that is uh, with the, the overlay of an animation of the Laddie spacecraft. And so you can kind of see the little cone off the back of it, and uh, that you know that it has a shape to it. And so um, what's really cool is that these. Hang on. Sorry. <laughs> These two spacecraft are, of course, whizzing past each other. I think LRO's in a north-south orbit, and Lottie's in this kind of east-west thing, and so they're whizzing past each other. So they really had to get the timing correct to get this photo. And also, I think they had to turn LRO a little bit away from where it normally points down to get this photograph. And so it's pretty cool. Uh, oh, there we go. There's another screen share that works. Uh, that's a pretty cool picture of Lottie from LRO. I blogged about that over on CosmoQuest. Mm -hmm. These LRO. pictures are the coolest things ever. Yeah. These yeah. spacecraft to spacecraft pictures. It yeah. just really shows you, you know, we're really there. Yep. We're there. I, we're there I think this is great. Ways. But I think this is great, like, where people have asked, like, couldn't the Hubble Space Telescope take pictures of the moon? Couldn't Hubble, t you know, see other satellites? How come satellites don't pick, take pictures of other satellites? How do I even know that you even landed on the moon? Is sort of the, the way this always ends. <laughs> and so here's here's what you get, which is two spacecraft orbiting the moon at different orbits, w pretty much the highest resolution camera that's ever been sent to the moon. It was a really tough shot, and they got it, but it's low res, it's blurry. That's I love I love that they de I I, I think I made up this word, but maybe not. They de smeared. <laughs> The spacecraft, yeah. <laughs> and so you see the spacecraft, and then you see like the background of the moon smeared behind it. I like that they yeah. backed that that shape out. Yeah, yeah, they Which were really tracking amazing. the object. What's really amazing is that the the timing was incredible. Now, like everything else, they know when these things are going to be in in uh, in frame, but uh, Laddie was only in LROC's narrow angle camera frame for for one and a half milliseconds. Yeah. They managed to still snap it right in the middle of the frame. Now, yeah. now uh, uh, LROC's got a got a push broom imager, so that's why you don't get this. It's not like you know ready snap and you get this complete thing. So it does you know it goes it goes uh, row by row. So that's why it has the smear. But one one and a half milliseconds, not even just under that. That's incredible. I, I mean, that I've, blows my mind. I, I've watched the ISS transit the sun visually, and it's less than a second. I mean, it's amazing how. Zip, it's right through there. So, yeah. all right, uh, boy, I don't know if we have time for this one, uh, but it's too cool. All right, so Brian Coverline, I'm going to need you to break everyone's brains again, okay. <laughs> and this time to talk about a discovery of magnetic monopoles. Yes, so this this. First, is What's a magnetic monopole? But the quick answer? The quick answer. Uh, it's a magnetic charge. In, in simple terms, that's what it would be. If, if you look at electricity, there are positive charges and there are negative charges. And you can have a positive charge all by itself. You can have a negative charge all by itself. With magnets, you can't. You have a north pole and you have a south pole, but they always come in pairs on a magnet. And if you snapped a magnet in half, you'd have two magnets, each with their own north and south poles. So, so you can't get a North Pole just sitting there by itself. You can't get a South Pole just sitting there by itself. Those individual poles would be a magnetic monopole. That's or the idea. can you? Well, that's, that's always been the idea. So in, this was a paper that hit nature. And what it was actually about, it's actually condensed matter physics. They're, they're looking at super cold materials called Bose-Einstein condensates. And I can never... Those Einstein thingies. Uh, and there's all sorts of interesting things that can happen there, and one of the research lines has been trying to do things like simulated charges, vortices, simulated magnetic monopoles. This new paper is about a, a neat way of producing a, a simulation of a magnetic monopole within this fluid, within this Bose Einstein system. Um, and so it's it's pure condensed matter physics. Um, it's we found monopoles like this before, but this is kind of like a new way of doing it. So that's why it hit nature. Um, but it comes up into the news as monopoles have been discovered. So so these are virtual monopoles. These are not a real magnetic monopole particle. The reason it's relevant for astrophysics is that 
we have suspicions, suspicions that there really would be a real magnetic monopole. And the reason is because in electrodynamics, if a magnetic monopole existed, then charges would be quantized. Because of the symmetries of electromagnetism, if you have one magnetic monopole, then it gets quantized based upon the rotation of the particles, and you would have quantized charges. Well, we see quantized charges. We don't know why charges are quantized. And so there's this interesting little connection of why there might be a magnetic monopole. Right. Um, where are they coming from? Like, where did they find them? They just they. I mean, they, are they coming from the sun? Are they out in the? Are they out in the deep? The deep universe? Are they? You know, the oh, border of the, the solar system? The, the thing that they found in, in nature that they're talking about, they don't find them. They actually set up the system to to make them. So they they simulate these. They're not actual monopoles. What they are is like defects in the system that look like a charge. They look like a monopole. Okay, so it's it's a way you can set up the system. It's it's one of these things with quantum physics. With with condensed matter quantum physics, you can do all sorts of interesting things that simulate other systems. So so because of because of the superfluidity, because of the way that the quantum systems interact on a macroscopic scale, you can get all these weird things. So there's this whole branch of research on condensed matter physics looking at simulated charges and simulated monopoles and simulated everything else. It's kind of like a, a way to do a good test bed for, for these types of things. So they I mean, have the most discovered interesting, a new particle. Yeah, I mean, one of the most interesting places that they're doing all this research is these cold, cold places where they're, they're cooling things down, they're using lasers to extract, to line up um, uh, molecules so that they're all dancing in lockstep, and that these are like the coldest places pretty much in the universe or in these right. experiments. And and this is where these new forms of matter show up, these these Bose-Einstein condensates. And um, and so, you, you know, this is neat that some of the other outcomes of this is, you know, these magnetic monopoles. But I guess it's one of those situations where you won't get one of these necessarily in nature. Everything's going to be right. potter, think- right? They have searched for magnetic monopoles. There are projects to search for magnetic monopoles, and they haven't found any yet. It's, maybe they're in black those... holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. If they maybe. existed. If they existed, yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, send all confused emails to Brian uh, Koberlein, uh, at Brian Koberlein on Twitter. Um, okay, great. So let's, let's move on, David. Just a couple of things and just a little more time left. So let's talk about... Uh, well, one you did a, a you just released an article and I haven't read it, but sort of how to planetary image on the cheap and and this is this is great. I love when this happens. So so you have been you know week after week on the virtual star party. You with the rest of the people have been talking about the software we use, the telescopes, the techniques, the cameras, and we had uh, someone write in and kind of say. I've been doing some of this research, following some of these trails, and I've put together some ideas. And then you followed up and wrote a wrote an article on sort of like how people can get involved and do their own planetary imaging, and it's not that it's not that expensive. No, it's a, it's actually a lot of people are surprised that they may have this stuff lying around their house to start planetary imaging tonight. Uh, assuming, of course, you have a telescope in the laptop lying around your house because you do need those. Probably and the no most clouds. expensive things you need. And no clouds. And no, but, uh, no, it was, was Scott Weather Chapman machine. wrote wrote into us, and I was kind of intrigued. I actually learned some stuff. There were some programs he had on there, and anytime I write an article about like Registax or any of these programs, I usually get comments, which actually are kind of enlightening, where people will tell me all their favorite programs they use that somebody has uh, just put out there for free, and it's it's uh, it's kind of interesting. But I've been doing this for about a decade, over a decade, because it was the last Mars opposition, the one that, that was uh, the best opposition of the century back in 2003, not the last one, but that was one of the, the... I remember building the webcam to actually do that. And all you're really doing, this is actually my newer one in the daylight, this is just something I got $20 from Walmart, and you're just taking the lens off it, and then you're just putting something, uh, an eyepiece barrel, an inch and a quarter eyepiece barrel onto it so you can hook it into the eyepiece. And you're just imaging using, uh, I use K3 CCD tools, which used to be free, but now that uh, it was so popular, he charges $50 for it. But it's still a pretty good program. I use that for camera control, and I use Registax for image processing and cleanup in, in Photoshop sometimes for last-minute uh, processing and aligning of images. But it's, uh, it's a really cheap technique to just build a 
$20, $30 webcam into something that it takes pretty good photos. I mean, I've imaged the ISS passing over, uh, manually tracking with the scope. I've imaged Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, all the planets. I've imaged double stars. It won't do deep sky photography. It doesn't have the, the, the time exposure necessary to do it. You get way too much noise on the image, so it's not really suited for that kind of astronomy. And probably the hardest thing I find when I put it in, since I'm manually uh, focusing in a line, is uh, the initial acquisition of the image. And I have in the article how to go through how to actually get it centered, get it focused, get it aligned, run the video, and it's uh, it's it's fun. It's just a fun little technique for... I consider myself more of an astrophotography dabbler, but a mere mortal compared to a lot of these yeah, guys. Yeah, some of the people on the there, virtual so. tour party are pretty yeah. amazing. I'm in awe of that. I'm in awe the, of that, what some people do. But. I mean, kind of the magic to this is the video, the fact that you run video, that if you're doing planetary astrophotography, yeah. you're running video, and then you get this piece of software that pulls together all the little pieces from all the video and makes the best possible yeah. image. And so you're turning... You're, five minutes of video of Jupiter into one photograph, and the amount of detail in yeah, that one photograph blows away what you would have taken if you just took a, a single picture, and that's you're, the magic. You're just, you're just you're nabbing those little minute moments of good seeing that are like less than a fraction of a second. Some, some, some amateurs will go through those thousands of frames and pick them out one by one, but Registax has an algorithm that works pretty good where I tell it to just pick the 10% best frames that it thinks from the program, and it's it's pretty good, uh, yeah. to, to, and it's a lot quicker than, than the, and a lot less eye strain than going through thousands of frames. Bottom line, if you have a telescope, you can get an object in that telescope. You're willing to buy a $30 webcam. The software's free. No excuse. And, and people ask me, what's the best webcam? And I say, it's the one you got lying around the house, basically. So it's, uh, I'll, go ahead and try what you got. It might work. All right, I'll, just, I'll take this one. There you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay, great. So, uh, actually, we've got a question uh, from Rachel Fry, uh, who wants to know any discussion of what happened to you two, I guess, to the to the Mar the, uh, the Chinese moon rover. Has anyone been following that story? I've been seeing what Emily Lactawal has been putting up uh, on the Planetary Society blog, and that's a... Uh, she's... she's usually pretty on top of these things because she's actually looking at the news that's coming out of China um, and sometimes you know has an attempt to uh, uh, decipher what they're saying through different translations. Um, it looks like basically we have to wait. It's, it's in the lunar night now. Even if it was fine, we'd still have to wait before we get any information back. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's 14 days of darkness, Earth, Earth days of darkness that we have to, you know, wait for it to come out. So potentially, you two may, may, be, um, may be permanently, you know, permanently down now, and in which case we won't hear anything back. Um, so it's just it's kind of a waiting game at this point. Story. It, yeah. it, needs, it needs to make it till the April 15th total lunar eclipse so mm -hmm. I can see it from the surface. Well, the question yeah. is: is like, it, is is uh, is Chang A still still working? Right, so the rest I, of the mission. Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, because that landing. has that has cameras on it as well and everything. So yeah. I I don't know if yeah. I don't know what the status is there. I think this is basically just the, the Jade Rabbit rover. Uh, yeah, and it, Ken Creamer's been doing all the reporting on Universe Today, and we should get him in one of these sometime. Uh, but he's been he's been reporting on it like incredible depth. So I hate to do this, but I guarantee if you go to Universe Today, you'll have all your questions answered. I also included and a link to Emily's post in the event yeah. page. So. Yeah, but, but Ken has been doing, has been like working on these really cool panoramic images and mm -hmm. really reporting on the, the troubles that the mission has been having. So Well, Ken's, so. Been, putting, Ken's been putting the images together that have been going out into the world, so um, he's done a great job. Yeah, yeah, he's been actually been processing these panoramic views. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to Ken. He should come and join us sometime. I'll nag him. Um, okay, well, let's uh, let's wrap this up. We're kind of running out of time. So, uh, everyone, let's hear your shameless self promotion. Brian Coverline, where can we find out more? Uh, you can find me on Google Plus. I'm on Twitter at Brian Coverline. I'm also on my website, BrianCoverline.com. Awesome. David Dickinson. Uh, I'm Astro Guys with the Z across all platforms. I was active this week on Canada.com, Universe Today, and my own site, Astro Guys. And oh, get out there and observe Mercury this weekend. It's the best weekend for the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Mercury at dusk. 
Yeah, so we didn't get a chance to talk about that, but but Mercury, good yes, talk Mercury, Mercury, go see. Go see. <laughs> Jason Major, where do we find out more? I'm over at lightsinthedark.com. I am uh, on Universe Today writing occasional little posts about cool stuff, and I'm also at Discovery Space News uh, doing the same. I'm, I tweet a lot. I'm over at JP Major on Twitter, uh, and I'm on Facebook as well. And I'm on Google+. Plus. I don't know where I'm not uh, on. Where yeah. at. You're not on YouTube much. I am not on YouTube much, no. Um, so yeah. I'm sorry about that. I don't have I don't have uh, a, a video producer like you do, Fraser, <laughs> to make are, to make awesome videos for me. Are Are you on Quora? <laughs> what is your question on Quora? I don't know what that is. Explain. There you go. There's one. <laughs> it's a place. Search. You'll love it. Do a search. You'll be stuck there all day. Oh man, another thing. Another place. <laughs> be another all thing. everywhere, all the places. All right, Morgan, Raymer, where do we find out more? Yeah, the website's cosmicchatter.org. We're cosmic underscore chatter on Twitter. And if you head over to CosmoQuest, you can listen to the monthly news roundup right now and hear another take on pretty much all this stuff. Dr. Nicole Gallucci, where do we find out more? I don't know. Where am I? I am Noisy Astronomer. I live over at CosmoQuest. Uh, in fact, uh, I have my own blog is sad and pathetic, but I've been blogging a lot on CosmoQuest and Discovery, so go check those out. Uh, in particular, I'm very proud. I just posted a link in the Hangouts of uh, some, some tutorial videos. We just finished up uh, redoing the citizen science tutorial videos for CosmoQuest. If you want to know how to mark creators like a pro, or at least like me, who's not really a pro at all, but Stuart! Help me out. He's a pro. Uh, go check out those video tutorials for the moon, for Vesta, and for Mercury. How to mark creators for fun and non-profit. Non <laughs> there you go. For, for fun science. and science. <laughs> and, of course, I am the publisher of Universe Today. And uh, and as, as, uh, as Jason said, we've been doing a ton of new videos. Um, we just wrapped up editing on 12 more. So, uh, how fast do black holes spin, and can Jupiter turn into a star, and do moons have moons? So, lots of great topics, and these will trickle out onto our YouTube channel over the next month. So, um, Fraser, where do you get the ideas for these for the questions? I mean, do you just do you just have a do you have a brainstorming session where you all sit down with a six pack and and try to figure out who would ask what about what? I think I think you could go through the unanswered questions of these hangouts yeah. because we do get so many we can't get to. And I you can just like I have out. a I have a spreadsheet where I just put every question uh, that I that I think of that I see people asking that people are emailing me to ask that seem to recur on Universe Today and I and I and then I troll through that list of questions. I actually have a list of questions that has about two or three hundred in it that I that I. We'll pluck from and tweak. So yeah, so more videos to come. Many more videos to come. Are you kidding? Bananas. We've just gotten started. So, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone for for uh, joining us. Thanks to the team for participating. It's always a pleasure, and we'll Are see we you the all tiny next squares? week. Tiny, the squares. tiny squares. Goodbye, mm -hmm. tiny squares. <laughs>